So did you take care of all the business you needed to, John? Yeah, yeah, I think we're all good. Okay, yeah. good. And it looks like you are recording, so that's good as well. Yeah. Um, the, for those of you who uh, joined us, uh, was gosh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, for the persimmons, uh, welcome back. For those of you who don't, uh, weren't able to attend the last meeting, the, my name is Greg Rager. I'm a um, volunteer at South Coast Research Station there in Irvine. Many of you I know have, have been there before. I am a, a former member of the Orange County California Rare Fruit Growers. Um, when I moved out to Temecula uh, a few years back, it kind of made getting to the meetings a little bit more difficult. Um, and where, where I'm at right now, I'm just about equidistant from the Riverside, the Orange County, and the two chapters that you all have down there. So I'm, I'm literally between a rock and a hard spot and, and no easy way to go. Um, I have also given presentations there at um, your facilities. Um, at least one of them that I can recall was on persimmons. And uh, I helped in a grafting demonstration down there at the, I think it's the Bancroft Center, right? John, the Bancroft Center, yeah. So um, welcome again. And John's going to help out by, is should he, he's going to not only help people come into the meeting that might be jumping in, but he's also going to help uh, answer uh, the, the group chat there, the Zoom group chat. So I believe we're going to have everybody on mute as we wade through the presentation. If you happen to have a pencil and a piece of paper there, if you're like me, if I don't write it down right away, I will forget uh, what question I had uh, a couple minutes later. And with that, I'll go ahead and start a shared screen and we'll start talking about avocados. For those of you, most of you, I, I would assume are familiar with avocados, but you might not be familiar with some of the varieties. You may or may not have avocados in your backyard, but this is a general presentation that could be given to both an advanced group and to a, a beginning group. So there may be some simplistic things in there and just bear with us on that. Uh, I also will apologize in advance. I get that teacher tone to my voice really quick. So you can feel free to ignore that. Uh, my college students do anyway. So um, this presentations on avocado varieties and cultural practices of Southern California. And, um, and once again, my name is Greg Rager. I'm um, a University of California Master Gardener, which means nothing other than I can uh, uh, take a test and read a book. And uh, I'm um, a platinum level, which means nothing more than I volunteer down there way more than I should. But um, you all know about volunteering because you're part of CRFG. Um, I've been a volunteer there at SCREC now, the South Coast Research and Extension Center for, I think about 15 years now. It's, it's, uh, it's getting pretty close. I don't remember exactly when I started going down there, but um, ironically enough, it's the avocados that, that brought me to there. And uh, we were putting together a calendar that we made available to several groups in the past. And it was in photographing the avocados for that calendar that kind of brought me into the fold down there. I have been a community college adjunct professor. They gave us, they give the adjuncts, the part-timers, that title there at Mount Sac, which I'm happy for. And I've been a college instructor for uh, well over 30 years now, and one of the classes I teach is the 19th century of film photography. I'm an old school photographer, but I also retired from a little startup company called Xerox. You might have heard of them, where I worked with digital technologies for, uh, oh goodness, uh, about 20 years. The, uh, let me see. We had this working area. There we go. Um, the avocados, and I need to move the bar because it's right in the middle. There we go. Uh, beauty and benefits in your garden, colorful fruit, and of course, most of you know what they taste like. 
Um, I like the spring and the fall colors. You've got a little bit of color in the fall, but in the spring, not only do you have the green of the leaves, but that flush takes on kind of a, a reddish, um, a burnt, burnt red color to that, which I think is kind of pretty. They can be a, generally a small tree, depending upon the variety and how you prune it, and the fruit has that healthy kind of oil in it. Some facts about the California avocado. Um, the California avocado belt runs from your neck of the woods down there in San Diego up to Morro Bay, and this is about 300 miles of nice coastal weather where avocados are, are grown um, just tremendously, just got that wonderful climate for them. Fall Brook, which is on the other side of the freeway from Temecula out here, is known for its avocado groves. And uh, they claim, although there's no official recognition, the title avocado capital of the world. Uh, Governor Newsom declared it the state fruit in 2013, although I'm kind of wondering what took everybody so long. Uh, Judge R.B. Ord brought avocado trees to Mexico, from Mexico to his Santa Barbara home in 1871. For those of you who like the Fuerte avocado, um, that is Spanish for strong, it was propagated in a California nursery in 1911. And right about the time that they started planting commercial uh, plantings for avocados, there was a freeze that came through in 1913 and um, basically all of the avocado trees, except for the Fuerte, survived, it, it were killed. But the Fuerte, that's where it gets its name about being strong. And we'll talk about this a couple times. The bacon avocado, no, it does not taste like bacon, but it's named for James Bacon out of Buena Park. He, I guess he used to be a neighbor of uh, Knott's, as in Knott's Berry Farm fame. And there's other variations of that bacon include Jim Bacon and Jim, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. There's some vocabulary. Um, I'll try to be brief here. Uh, we're going to make this presentation available to you so you can spend some time on it, but there's some words I'm gonna be using here and I wanna make sure we're all kind of on the same page. Alternate bearing, you may have this with some of your fruit crops, your fruit tree crops. And what happens is one year you may get a lot of fruit and the next year you may not get a lot. And part of this is just generic with a particular variety, but sometimes you're able to minimize that by proper tree health, maintenance, uh, proper irrigation, good pruning practices and thinning the fruit. And that means thinning the fruit when it's small, not when it's you know almost full size. Generally speaking, avocados you don't need to thin. Uh, you may have heard the term cukes or cocktail avocados, and those are some small seedless avocados. And I've seen them mostly with queen avocados. Um, we'll talk more a little bit about those later, but um, those are about the size of a pickle and or a cucumber, a small cucumber, and they do not have a seed in them. And that's why they're prized by the chefs as a garnish. They can just slice them right up and put them on a plate. Avocados mature on the tree, but they ripen off the tree. And this is similar, this is called climacteric fruit. And this includes bananas, apples, peaches, persimmons, which most of you are familiar with, and tomatoes. They, they will ripen once they're off the tree. Things that don't do that are things that you pick when they're ripe, like cherries, citrus, and strawberry. So you may be hearing that term a little bit as well. Commercial ripeness references that the fruit can withstand the commercial harvesting, processing, packaging, and shipping. But if it were tree mature or tree ripened, uh, the fruit is going to show a lot of bruising and it may actually rot before it actually hits the market. This is part of the reason why some of your fruits, you know, you are, you are the fruit growers that have these trees in your backyard. So you know how much better the fruit tastes when it ripens, um, such as a peach, on the tree versus the things that are brick hard when you get them in the store. Cultivar or variety. Um, this is a named and developed and marketed type of avocado. Um, Haas, Gwen, Holiday are examples. Now these cultivars are often patented or registered. I believe, I don't know whether it still holds true, 
but the registration um, and patenting used to expire after 17 years unless you renewed it. I think it's 17. And if it is patented, um, you as, as growers should not be exchanging that amongst uh, gardeners. Um, those patented varieties can take decades to develop and market and uh, sometimes 15, 20, 30 years before it actually uh, hits the market. Drop fruit, this is where it, when the temperature starts spiking, you may know that as the June fruit drop. Well, why does that happen? In many cases, June is the month where things start warming up. June gloom is starting, uh, June gloom is starting to go away. And the, the plant knows this and it'll start uh, getting rid of its babies, its fruit, because it know it can't handle all of that. And one of the things that you can do is water the trees ahead of time and also uh, thin the fruit. And that's going to help the tree um, uh, possibly minimize the amount of fruit that it drops. Uh, easy peel, there's a, some of the avocados where literally you cut it in half and you just kind of squeeze the peeling and the, the, all of the flesh pops right out. And in other ones, you need to take a knife and slowly peel it away. But that easy peel that refers to that. Uh, NPK, you should be aware of this as gardeners. That's your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. And these are the important uh, plant nutrients that are critical for plant growth. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Pit rattle, some of you may be familiar with the term pit rattle. There are some varieties. I've seen it mostly with Mexicola, Mexicola Grande, and also uh, Edinger that um, it, it, sometimes there's a little bit of extra space between the seed and the flesh. And when you pick up the avocado, literally you can hear the pit inside rolling around. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, ripening, we talked about this. Um, avocados are not edible directly from the tree. They have to go through that mature stage and then they're picked and then that ripening starts. So only after the stem, stem is severed will avocados begin that ripening process. Ethylene gas, which is a, a gas that apples will outgas, uh, helps produce that softening. So if you want to speed up the process of avocados, most of you know this. Um, I knew this as a kid. Um, uh, not necessarily with avocados, but with other fruit. Put it in a bag with an apple and uh, it'll help ripen it. Rootstock, you should be aware of this. Um, if you take and plant a seed from, say, a hoss, or has, if you want, I, I, I will use both terms. Even though I know it's supposed to be has, I sometimes say has because uh, to me that sounds like a German name. I lived in Germany, so I sometimes kick over on that real quick. But if you plant that seed from that avocado, you will not get that variety of avocado. So you've got to have rootstock that you can take scion or budwood and graft it to the rootstock. A typical rootstock for Southern California is what's called Duke 7, sometimes Topa Topa D9. Um, if you want the, the fast and dirty version, just get a Mexican avocado, plant the seed, and six months or a year, you'll have a, a tree that's big enough to graft to. That's the Mexican or the Mexico La Grande. Uh, cyan or budwood, you should be familiar with this. This is a small stick. Um, depending upon who you talk to, some people swear by only having a few buds on it. Um, I generally say somewhere between four and six buds. Or if you're referring to it as budwood, you may literally be taking just a single bud and grafting it. An example of this would be a um, Hass uh, scion grafted to a Duke 7 rootstock. And the selection is based on flavor, yield, the, the average size, and other unique qualities. And uh, this is a question we get all the time. Uh, avocado trees don't like multiple variety grafts to one rootstock. So uh, stick to one variety per rootstock. Seed to flesh ratio, this is uh, some, and I was asking John, is that, is that, and to make sure that she, uh, send her a note if she's here online tonight, John. I've got to have that picture of uh, that you sent out on the group um, showing that little avocado with the huge seed of it inside. But this, the seed to flesh ratio refers to how much of the flesh, the edible flesh, is inside. And this also often includes not only the pit, but the skin or the peeling as well. 
And this will vary from type to type, be it a Mexican or Guatemalan variety. And it will also variety within those types. And I've seen huge differences even from one fruit to the next fruit off of the same tree. If you don't know it, you'll know by the end of the presentation, avocado trees have what's called surface roots. Approximately 95% of their root system is in the first foot of soil. And that is a phenomenal amount of roots for a tree where a lot of times it's also the kid's playground and the kids are in there pounding on the, the soil and making it hard and all of a sudden the roots can't breathe. So the best way of dealing with this is to make sure that you have mulch around your avocado trees. If you've ever been to the South Coast Research Station and you've seen the avocado fields there, uh, there's nobody there sweeping up that litter. Uh, there, are, there are months and times of the year where it's literally uh, six to nine inches of uh, avocado leaves there. But you want to make sure there, you mulch it around to the drip line. And that's where when it's uh, misty, the, uh, the edge of the tree, the canopy, that's where all that moisture drips down. And you want to have all that compacted out to that point. What kind of fruit is it? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, some people think it's a vegetable. Some think, people think of it as a fruit. And here's a very interesting story by a gentleman uh, named W.B. Story. And it talks about it's technically a berry because there's varieties of fruits that are the fleshy fruits. And there are the droops and the berries. The droops Think of those as anything that has stones or pits. For example, a peach. Everybody knows how hard the uh, peach pit is. But a droop uh, typically has only a single seed, uh, a single seed, as do berries. But some of the berries do have multiple. Um, but this particular one, we're going to define the avocado as a single seeded berry. Avocados, where do they come from? Um, from? From what I understand in doing the research, somewhere in South Central Mexico, between 7,000 and 5,000 uh, BCE before current era. But it was several millennia before this wild variety was cultivated. Um, archaeologists have found domesticated avocado seeds. Now, I, I, I just was begging the question, how did they know they were domesticated? I, that's, I, that's something I haven't figured out yet. But anyway, supposedly there were domesticated avocado seeds buried with the Incan mum, mummies back in 750 BC, and that they were possibly uh, cultivated in Mexico as early as 500 BC. So um, I don't know where the, the difference between domesticated and cultivated, but uh, you can work from that. Spanish conquistadors loved the fruit, but they couldn't pronounce the Aztec word, and I'm not either, but uh, there it is. And theirs is aguacate, and that eventually became avocado in English. And uh, evidently, a Henry Stone, Sir Henry Stone, used that term in 1696 in an index of Jamaican plants. Some of you may know them as alligator pears, uh, midshipman's butter, marrow, shell pear, Spanish pear, subaltern's butter. Um, in, I guess, South Africa and the UK, they call them avos, which I'm hearing more and more here as well. And some call it the butter fruit in parts of India. It was introduced in Spain in 1601, Indonesia 1750, Brazil in 1809, and made it to the United States in 1825. Um, South Africa and Australia in the late 19th century and an area that we now know as Israel in 1908. Um, it wasn't Israel before the, the end of World War II, so I kind of put that little zinger in there. United States, it was introduced in Florida and Hawaii around 1933 and California in uh, 1856. Other members of that Laurel family include uh, Sweet Bay, which you're probably familiar with, and sassafras. Now, there are three primary types of avocados. Their uh, West Indian one, we'll deal with that one first. Uh, that is one that we cannot grow here. We don't have the, the we, have, we have the temperature certainly, but not necessarily the heat 
humidity uh, that required for that. They can grow some varieties of these in Florida, but most of the avocados we have here are either the Mexican, uh, Guatemalan, or a combination thereof. The Mexican avocados are the smaller ones. They usually have a very thin black skin, which is usually smooth. And when we're in the field and we're trying to figure out what variety of uh, avocado this is on the tree without crawling through all the mulch, a lot of times we'll just take a leaf and crush it. And if it smells like licorice or anise, that is a Mexican uh, avocado. And uh, in that culture, uh, some of you may be familiar with this, they will use that leaf um, as a uh, flavoring, as a uh, 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 kind of like we would use a bay leaf here. So they use that in both dried and fresh. And it's uh, kind of a, a, a very interesting flavor. The Guatemalan variety do not have that anise flavor or scent and they have a thicker skin that is often rough. And if you have a combination of those, when you think about such as a, um, a Hass avocado that's ripened, it's almost black, but yet it's got the bumpy skin. And so that means it's got a little bit more Mexican than it has Guatemalan. And this is also going to give you some ideas of when they bloom, the hardiness, to cold tolerance, and you'll notice that the Mexican ones are more cold tolerant than certainly the West Indian ones. And this also has to do with the toxicity to animals. The only ones that we are able to eat as far as the leaves is the Mexican variety, and the other ones can be poisonous to, to animals. So you gotta be careful what you're messing with here. It's recommended that you don't plant avocado uh, trees near animal enclosures because they may not be able to, to separate uh, some of those leaves and some of the other materials. Um, this is another one of those burning questions. Um, a lot of people think, well, it's not all about Hass, but I would suggest it probably is because if it wasn't for Rudolf uh, Hass, then we might not have the varieties of avocados and certainly not the has avocado, which accounts for about 80% of the avocado, avocados grown worldwide. And for those of you who are familiar with the La Habra Heights Avocado Festival, a lot of that got its, its start back there when Haas planted some avocado seeds. It was three of them and two of them uh, failed to produce any trees. One, he was trying to graft at least a couple times a Fuerte avocado to it, and it didn't take. And then there was a, a supposedly a professional grafter named Calkins out there. He said, you know what, just leave the tree be. It's, it's, it's a healthy tree, it's strong. And when it started producing fruit, he found his children liked the taste. Long story short, he started selling them. Um, I thought it was phenomenal that his first uh, real commercial success was with a grocery store in Pasadena on Colorado Street, where the chefs that were working for the wealthy residents were buying those fruits for a dollar each, which is about uh, equivalent to $14 in, in 2019 money. So that was some um, pretty expensive avocados back then. Haas was able to patent the tree in 1935. And this was the first U.S. tree patent. I wasn't aware of that. And he made a contract with uh, Harold Brokaw to grow and sell the grafted ones. Uh, and Brokaw was to get the majority of the proceeds. Um, Haas made a profit of less than $5,000, which doesn't sound like a, not, a lot right now. But if you apply a factor of, you know, 14 times, uh, which is what the fruit was costing back there, then five five thousand dollars back then, equivalent of about ninety thousand dollars a day, is is not too bad. Um, Haas still remained a postman. He died of a heart attack in 1952, the same year his patent expired. The original Haas tree uh, lived to be 76 years old and was cut down on September 11th in 2002 after a battle with the uh, the root rot, which is very typical to the avocado trees. And as I mentioned before, 
the um, avocado industry is about a billion dollars a year um, attributed to Haas, and that accounts for 80% of all the avocados grown uh, worldwide. Now, this is one of the most confusing parts of avocados. You're going to hear a lot about type A and type B pollination. You're, we're going to have a chart. Uh, it might not be very easy for you to read, but it's, it's going to be made available to you that will tell you about the, the most typical varieties of avocados and where they're A and B pollinators. The technical version is there are two flowering types with avocados. One's referred to as an A and the other as a B flower type. The A varieties open as female flowers on the morning of the first day. The flower closes late morning or early afternoon and it remains closed until the afternoon of the second day when it opens as a male. The B variety opens as a female in the afternoon on the first day, closes late that afternoon, and then reopens as a male the following morning. The simple version of this, for your best crop yields, make sure you have at least two trees, one A and one B type, for cross-pollination, or make sure there is another type in your neighborhood. Um, we uh, give some space on our property to a gentleman that uh, has thousands of beehives, and I was talking to him a while back about, well, you know, how far do these bees go? And he said they'll go three miles in search of pollen. So if you've got any neighbors anywhere in your neighborhood that have an avocado tree, find out a, do they know what type it is? And then look it up and figure out, oh, then I need to get whatever. If you've got room for a couple avocado trees, then you solve the problem. And one of the things John asked was, well, we're going to be able to have avocados year round. I said, yeah, we got a chart that will help you with that. And on that chart is, is it A or B varieties? Uh, ripeness. Now, um, I added um, a couple things to this presentation. I just happened to pick up, I gave this pre a similar presentation in 2016, and um, I didn't realize that uh, there are a lot of information, a lot of good information has been made available the last four or five years. And I found this on the internet where it helps you understand the stages of ripeness by the numbers. Uh, number one is your hard avocado going to two to three to four to five and by the time it hits to five this is the one we're all familiar with it's ready to eat right now but don't let it sit around too long because if you let it sit around too long it'll start um, rotting and uh, avocados when they start rotting they get a little bit on the rancid side it also has on that website a really kind of a cool avocado yield calendar Avocados are rated based on the size, and that's what that bottom photograph talks about, to fill a 25 pound carton. And this was something I probably knew, but didn't really think about it. But uh, when you look at how many, like the number 84, it takes 84 of those, call them about two and a half inches tall, to, it takes 84 of those to fill a 25 pound carton. But the one on the, five, the far right, which is about a four inch avocado, it only takes 28 of those to make 25 pounds. So I thought that was kind of a cool way of thinking about the size of avocados. And once again, this all varies to variety and even uh, avocados sitting on the same tree. Stages of ripeness by the stem. This is something that I recently added uh, when I was looking for photographs to include in the presentation. Um, some of you might be very familiar with these. As a matter of fact, the one on the left kind of looks like it could be, might be holidays. I, I, I didn't take these photographs, but uh, they were ones that helped make my point, so I included them. The one on the left, if you start looking at the stem, where the stem joins the avocado, and if it's too green, it's probably not mature. Remember, we're talking about is it mature or is it ripe? And it won't start ripening until you take it off the tree. But if you pick it too early, the oils won't have a chance to ripen. So if we look closely at where the stem joins the avocado on the photograph on the left, 
the stem looks still very, very green. It's a light green. It's about the same color green as the avocado in this particular case. And I would say that might be getting close, but it's not ready yet. You may also notice right by that person's thumb is a avocado leaf that has a brown uh, tip to it. And that is leaf burn. We're gonna talk about that under diseases, but that's what it looks like. And that's very typical around here, because especially if we don't get a lot of rainfall and if you're not treating the water, which most people aren't for their backyard trees, we have a lot of salts in the water and in the soil here, and the avocado trees will show that as a leaf tip burn. The avocado in the middle is getting very close. It's about right, and the stem is starting to turn a little bit on the brown side. And if we look at the photograph on the right-hand side, that's probably too late. Those have passed maturity. And at that point in time, if I were to cut those open, I, you notice how dark brown the stems are? If I were to cut those avocados open, I would half expect to find the pit starting to put out roots. Because when it does eventually, and it will eventually drop off the tree, when it does drop off the tree, uh, that root um, that is formed by the pit we'll start digging into all of that leaf litter and you go back a short time later and you've got yourself a small um, avocado tree. The photo at the bottom is supposed to be a queen avocado and queens, I like to think of those as being actually football size. I've seen some literally the size of a football, but notice this one is very small. Notice it's got this very wrinkly uh, neck to it. And if you'll also notice that the, the, where the stem is joining the fruit, it's got this brown ring to it. And that is one of the diseases, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And I would not expect, if I was out there, I, I, you can't tell whether this avocado has gotten pulled from the tree, but if it was pulled from the tree, there's no way it's ever gonna get ripe. Um, it's just too immature. And my guess is with that, that you know that kind of a um, stem disease there it's probably not going to get to be mature uh, but especially if you picked it right now here are some of the varieties now um, with the in addition to the presentation we're going to be sending you a list i'll show you briefly when we're done that gives you more information about these avocados but these are typical to the avocados most of these um, you're probably you are aware of. Some are only available um, either at, as a specialty at like Vista. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have visited some of the nurseries in Vista, but generally you don't find, let's say a Pinkerton or a Charwell avocado any place other than at a farmer's market. For those of you who have been to uh, Screck in the past, uh, we, you do know that we do have avocado tasting events whenever they have open house there because generally there's some avocado that's ripe uh, pretty much a year round. Fuerte, once again, this is the one that's uh, Spanish for strong and it's uh, one that is more cold hardy than some of the other varieties. Pinkerton, uh, boy, that, that one's a tough one to figure out when it's actually ripe because a lot of times it has this very elongated neck and you've got to be careful with this one. I've had Pinkertons, the neck is ripe, but the bottom is still brick hard. So I usually feel somewhere around the middle for that happy medium. And you'll notice in most of these photographs, um, all of these I took, you'll notice in most of the photographs, it shows the two halves. I went through about um, six or eight flats, not six or eight, Pinkerton avocados, but six or eight flats of avocados before I found one that when it was cut open, at least half of it looked halfway decent. So, um, because what I noticed is when it wasn't ripe it, on the inside, it was more greenish than yellowish. And you can kind of see a little bit, but this was finally one that took a little bit. Also, we don't have a, a scale with these. But if you'll notice on that Pinkerton, you notice that kind of brown plate that everything's sitting on. 
most of these were photographed on that same plate. And with some of them, you can get a little bit of a sense of the variety, uh, how, si how large that variety is based on that, that plate. Whoops, sorry. Uh, we have our ever popular um, Haas here at the bottom. And you'll also have the Charwell. Notice the Charwell, that seed coating, uh, that little paper shell around it, that's a little bit on a purplish side of kind of a purplish brown. And by the way, that seed coating, you can see it very well on the Fuerte and the Haas. That seed coating is also an indication of whether it's ripe once you've cut it open. I mean, once you've cut it open, you really, you, know, you can't go back. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. But the, when the, it's that brownish color that you see on those two, which is most typical of what we see, that's a good indication that that um, avocado was ripe. You'll also notice on the Pinkerton, it looks like it's got a crack running down the middle of the pit. And that is probably a sign that the um, root is starting to grow on the inside. And we'll have a couple more where you can actually see where the root um, uh, feelers are starting to grow, the root tendrils. A couple more varieties, uh, Jan Boyce, you might be familiar with that one. Adrenal, you probably aren't that familiar with that one. Uh, Helen, uh, supposedly we have, we have a joke in the field that is it Helen with one L or two L's? I, I've, I've tried and tried and tried to see if there is a Helen avocado with one L, but all I find is two L's, but it's kind of a joke out there. And the, of course you have the reed there. And if you've ever tried a reed avocado, uh, that is one of my favorites. You'll also notice now, I, I've never really noticed a pit rattle with this, but you'll notice on that reed, there's a little bit of extra space around that, where that pit sits in there. And that uh, would be the similar sort of thing that happens when you get that pit rattle. If you only have room for one avocado tree, I would seriously consider reed because uh, in, in my view, it's a pretty nice one. Uh, Nimlio, uh, if we look at the Nimlio up there, you'll notice that it's, well, why did it, well, first of all, they're large. They're much larger. They're, they're about cannonball size. And you'll notice that we have some that look like they're starting to turn black. Those are the mature ones. And then you have some of the green ones, which are your immature ones. And the Nimlio is one of those varieties where you will get both mature and immature uh, uh, fruit on there at the same time. And that's another reason why from a commercial standpoint, you won't see um, many Nimlios because your commercial grower is not going to want to wait 15 to 18 months for a harvest. They're going to want to get uh, at least one harvest out of the year. Surprise is one of those that typically does well. Um, uh, holiday and harvest are also ones that typically do well. Holiday got its name because it's, uh, it's, it's mature. I won't use the word ripe, I'll use mature. It's mature around the holiday season. So expect it to be mature anywhere between uh, Halloween and uh, New Year's. And that's kind of a, a nice way of being able to remember when that is. The harvest one there, you can start seeing uh, the beginnings of, of a root starting to come out. That's kind of a, and if you look at the avocado on the left and the one on the right, you can see when the pit was pulled out, you're seeing those little root structures that were already working into the avocado. And if you happen to harvest one uh, off of your tree and you're starting to see roots, you better figure out what you're gonna need uh, to be doing with the rest of the avocados. We use that term stripping the tree there. Um, this is also a good point, because I know what's coming up here. Uh, quite often we get this question, um, is, is can I grow avocados in a container? Um, I would say the better way of stating that would be, should I grow avocados in a container? And the answer to that is um, no, don't even, don't even think about it. Um, going out on the internet here uh, was a, a person that's um, telling you that sure, you can grow them. These are probably less than what we affectionately refer to as five gallon containers. Um, as, as you know, they're now referred to as number five because somebody made an issue about it doesn't really hold five gallons. But I can't imagine a 10-foot avocado tree 
trying to go in five uh, gallons or less of roots. This is now, would it possibly survive as a tree? Maybe, but don't expect it to produce a lot of fruit. Um, and this is the point, Bob, are you still out there? Um, I'm gonna pick on Bob for just a second because I know him and I see him all the time. He might say, well, you know, you can, you can put it in a container. I, okay, maybe. Um, if you've got a, a 50, um, we recently got a 150 gallon container because our, uh, we have a camel out here. My wife has a camel and um, he keeps turning over the smaller containers. And we put a 150 gallon container out there and he's not able to turn that thing over uh, very easily. And yeah, maybe you could grow one in a 150 gallon container. But for those of you who've lifted uh, the number five pots full of dirt, you know how heavy five, pound, five uh, gallons worth of dirt are. And if you've gone to the number 15s, you know that it starts getting really heavy. So you can imagine how much 150 gallons of dirt is going to be and how are you gonna move it from one spot to another? So the answer here is no, in case you're wondering still. There are some smaller varieties, um, Holiday, Charwill, um, one that typically shows up as, oh yeah, you can grow that in a pot is Little Cotto. Um, those that, by the way, that's the variety and the color of the ripened fruit on those. If you're wondering what the B is and the A is, that's that B and A type. Um, on the top two photographs, we have a gem, and that's another example right there. I, I like, I, in retrospect, I like having that because now I can have this conversation about how two avocados off of the same tree can vary in size and how the pit size can vary from two avocados from the same tree. And this is a great example of that. A lamb has is a, an offshoot from your has. Um, it's, a, it's a decent avocado. And as you can see on both of these varieties, you get that um, paper-like coating and covering on the pit. And that's that nice brown color, which means they are certainly mature and ripe. This is to you probably an eye chart. Uh, from what I understand, a couple of you came in on smartphones and uh, you probably aren't able to see this at all. However, this is a variety chart and ripening schedule. And this is what you want to use as a gauge for getting avocados year round. Now, you may have in your climate down there some variances to this. This is based on the research station uh, in Orange County in Irvine. And this is nothing more than a gauge. As you know, when you grow fruit trees, uh, you're, every year the climate's different, different rainfall, you name it, it's variable. But if you have, let's say, room for three, certainly four avocados, you could have a Fuerte, which is a type B, a Gem, which is a type A, uh, uh, something like a Lampas, or a Nabal, or a Charwell. Look how long the, the season is for a Charwell. And then, of course, I would throw in something like a, a holiday in there. But those are going to allow you, if you have at least three, possibly four, uh, if you've got the space, you would have the, as close as you could get to having avocados year round. Uh, sometimes people will take and make a kind of a star shape where you've got um, an avocado tree in the middle, and then you put uh, two, three, or four on an outer perimeter to that, kind of like a, a ring with one in the middle. If you've got space for that, that would be just fantastic. I would make sure that you put those trees, if you're doing something like that, make sure they're probably at least 15 feet away from each other, depending upon the variety. But um, I, I'm a skinny guy and uh, you know I can't get in between some of these trees that have gotten full grown there at the research station. So you're in charge of pruning. And if you make sure you're pruning them to shape, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, um, and size, that's more, the most important, uh, then you can get away with a few things in there. So I would say a minimum of 10 feet, probably 15 feet, because if they're 15 feet apart, remember the trees are gonna grow out seven or eight feet. Now you're gonna be 
the leaves are going to be touching each other. Um, climate zones for Southern California. Uh, you all down there are in the, the primary climate zone. That's the Southern California coast southern zone. And you can see this runs all the way up to uh, uh, San Luis Obispo or Slowtown for those of us who have friends there. And along that coast, the, the, southern, the southern, northern, and central coast, that's kind of the premier spot for growing avocados. I was surprised when I saw this a chart, though, that they throw Temecula in the same climate zone as Fallbrook. Uh, Fallbrook, the reason why it does so well is it's on the west side, uh, sorry, the east side of the mountains there, so they don't get that blazing sun in the summer. Out here in Temecula, we have more of a Mediterranean climate, and it does great for olive trees and certainly um, the, the grapevines. Um, we're out here in the east end of wine country, and, uh, but I'm, I don't see a lot of avocados out here, but I do plan on trying to grow some out here myself with a lot of care and a lot of attention given to where am I going to put it on my property where it's not the low zone where all the cold goes in the winter, but it's not on the top of the hill of the, the plateau that we have the house sitting on and out there getting that scorching uh, southwest facing sun in the summertime. So, but I'm willing to also uh, uh, field test them knowing that there's a good chance that it's not going to do well. But if anybody can do it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'm, I'm not the sharpest hack in the box, but I kind of know what to look for. When you get out to uh, Hemet Riverside, you're in the interior. And um, I've heard out in Riverside when I gave a talk out to the CRFG Riverside group, a lot of them say Reed does halfway decently out in, in that area of Riverside. So, uh, but you guys should be fine. I, I wouldn't worry too much about the varieties there. Before planning, I'm sure you've heard this time and time again. Uh, everybody tells you to do it. Most of us don't do it. I'm just as guilty as the next person. But ideally, you want to figure out what kind of soil do I have? Is it clay? Is it sandy? Is it loam? Is it sandy loam? Is it compressed decomposed granite, which we have a little bit out here? Um, when I lived in Westminster, my neighbor had the best soil. And right across the cinder, cinder block wall fence, I had clay. So um, it took me about five years before the worms came back, but eventually we were able to, to get it to break up a little bit. Uh, avocados do not like wet feet, and I can't stress that enough. One of the things that you can do, especially if you have clay soil or slow draining soil, is to make what we refer to as an avocano. And you can see the example below. You want this thing to be well above the surface of your landscape or your, your lawn. We see this all the time. People dig a hole. They dig it uh, three times as wide and three times as big. They dump a bunch of amendments in there. And uh, a year or so later, that, that uh, tree is now below the soil level of the lawn. And when you water the lawn, all that water drains into that hole. And if you've got clay soil, there's no place for that water to drain off. And in three, somewhere between three and seven years, you're asking the help desk, why did my tree die? It was doing great, but about five years into it, it just rolled over and died. Well, it rolled over and died because you didn't give it a chance to breathe. If you do have a clay soil, plant the avocado tree about eight to 10 inches above the soil level. Dig it, dig the hole three times as wide, but no deeper than the, the height of the pot that it's in. You want that pot before you take it out to sit eight to 10 inches above the soil level. And when you backfill it, do not add amendments to it. Amendments differ from mulch in that amendments go into the soil, whereas mulch goes on the surface. Um, and the, if you add amendments to it that's not the native soil, what will happen is that the, the roots will grow out to where they hit resistance with the native soil, and then they'll stop growing. So you want to break that up. And if you use an auger to dig that soil, you might end up with this beautiful clay pot 
you want to break that up, take a spade, make little sh star shaped areas in that because just the fact of using the auger can turn some of that soil into a hardened surface. So you want to make sure you break that up so the trees have a place to go. Or you can use what's called a French drain and you can buy that at, the, at any the box stores or the hardware stores. And it's a four inch water pipe that has pre-drilled holes in it. And you put that vertically in an area away from the roots and, and you make sure that it's going below where the uh, tree is growing as far as the, the bottom of the hole. And that way when it does fill up, the water has room to drain away into that French drain. And you want that to be about a foot or 18 inches or even more lower than the bottom of the uh, hole that you dug for the avocado tree. It's always a good idea to have your a pH, uh, your soil checked before planting any fruit tree. Uh, for avocados, you want a little bit on the acidic side, uh, six to six and a half. Definitely make sure that you uh, keep in mind where is that sun coming from. Um, I had a southwest facing cinder block wall when I was in um, uh, Westminster and an avocado tree planted in front of that would not do well because during the summer that tree is just going to cook, uh, which is what happened when I planted uh, uh, blueberry bushes there. And then I went to the, by the way, just a tidbit of information. I went to um, one of the nursery stores and they go, oh, try, um, try um, um, artichokes. And I thought, well, yeah, artichokes, those grow up in uh, the Carmel area along the coast. And they go, no, they can, they can handle the heat somewhat. I did, and those grew up to be um, seven and, and eight foot tall. I guess they love the heat there. So that might be something for you as well. For multiple planted avocado trees, remember you want to place them at least 10, preferably 15 feet apart, which is going to allow for growth and maintenance. Then there's a, a test there. If you're not sure what your soil does, there's what's called a percolation soil test. Um, follow that. And uh, that will help you figure out, is my soil going to let things drain away from it? Pruning. Um, this is one of the most difficult things for a lot of people. Uh, within my circle of contacts and friends, I'm known as a very heavy pruner. And part of the reason is because if I get involved in, in, in pruning somebody's tree, usually it's been neglected for eight to 10 years. And at that point, I'm doing damage control. A very dear friend of mine that, that Bob and most of you might know, uh, Isabel Barkman, uh, uh, we, um, we go out together a lot of times. And she's a very delicate pruner because um, she's more concerned about will it produce fruit next year? I'm more concerned about what's it gonna do um, a couple years down the road when uh, we do the heavy prune today. So once again, it's just different philosophies. Avocado trees do not require much pruning, um, but you wanna let the tree develop naturally. And at the same time, you wanna make sure that you're, it has a balance and you don't get out of hand. We hear about avocado trees all the time. It, the roots raised my driveway. It destroyed my concrete sidewalk. Well, probably because it was a, an avocado tree that got 30, 40 or, or, or more feet tall. And just remember, if it's got a, a tree that's 25 or 30 feet tall, it has at least 25 or 30 feet of roots. Now, most of those are those surface roots that we talked about. And when they get big, they can, they can typically do damage. So keep that in mind when you're planting that tree. Use a root barrier or something but um, you wanna kind of control the height and that's gonna help minimize that impact of those roots. The varieties of trees that you have, uh, the height requirement you want. Uh, my wife is not interested in planting, grafting, watering, fertilizing, caring for the fruit trees. All she wants is the washed fruit cut and prepared and handed to her on a tray. Some of you may have somebody like that, um, so I want to make sure everything on our property is no taller than about eight or nine feet tall. I'm six foot seven. I've got a heck of a reach, but I'm not going to try to kill myself by climbing up a tree that's 30 feet tall, because if it's that tall, all you're doing is providing uh, fruit um, for the birds um, and for the rats. So just keep that in mind. Um, you're also trying to protect 
poor growth habits. I was in uh, Costco recently and they had avocado trees for sale in there. And I was, I'm, I'm a big Costco fan, but they, somebody kind of, in my opinion, didn't do a good job of selling them grafted uh, avocado trees. Some of the grafts were very, very weak to where the scion was literally doing a um, kind of a P-trap, you know, the, the drains in your sinks, it's got that, what's referred to as that P-trap in there that helps keep the smell from the sewer system coming back. Some of the grafts literally look like those P-traps. They were doing this, and I just know that in a very short period of time, that uh, tree is not going to be able to, to handle the, the load. Uh, also, don't let the tree get kind of out of proportion. Uh, you get these long, if you get a long leggy growth, that probably means it's not getting enough light. So be careful, uh, these don't do well as an understory growth, but you, you have to kind of uh, prevent alternate bearing, uh, heavy, heavy crops as we talked about that. But when you prune it, you're also stunning the tree's growth. So a friend of mine has a, um, I think it's a holiday. I think it's a holiday avocado in their, their front yard. And it's about six or seven feet tall and about seven or eight feet around. And uh, part of the reason why it doesn't get any taller is they keep uh, taking cuttings from it for grafting. Um, but it produces a very nice crop year after year after year. Um, you also want to make sure that you don't cut too much that opens up the tree, the branches, uh, and the trunk to either sunburn or frost injury. And you want to make sure that you're keeping some of that canopy there. Uh, once again, remember that the foliage is what manufactures fruit for the tree. And if you reduce that by pruning it back too heavily, uh, the, the fruit yield may suffer. Remove as little of the green wood and the leaves as possible. Prune only after it's developed a sufficient foliage or canopy to minimize sunburn. Uh, we'll talk about sunburn in just a moment. Um, avoid pruning in the late summer and early fall because any new growth is gonna either be burned or um, if you do get a frost, it might uh, get frost injury. A lot of your avocado trees get these small little pencil sized sticks of, of branches that never really did anything. Typically those you just break off very easily or you, you break them off when you bump up against them. But the removing the dead wood uh, helps making the fruit uh, picking easier and it also helps with pest control. Um, you also may have, might have in the coast, coastal regions, uh, some of this dead wood, if you leave it on there, it can develop a rot. And that may cause the fruit, uh, the, the fruit to decay before uh, when it's ripening. Uh, the skirt or some of the lower branches of the avocado trees, you want to raise those so that, um, uh, raise them, what I mean by raising is cut them off so that it's going to help discourage rodents from climbing up a, a branch that's actually hitting the ground. Uh, to minimize sunburn, uh, mix a latex paint. This is not enamel, guys. Uh, latex paint, uh, I like one to two ratio, one part paint to two parts water. Some people recommend one to one, and this is uh, acts as a sunscreen for the trunk or for some grossly exposed areas while you're waiting for the canopy to develop. Mulch, we talked a lot about mulch. Um, the best thing you can do for avocado trees is let its own leaf litter act as a mulch. And it basically does a, a good, job, good job of inoculating that tree against some of the, the funguses and whatnot. So the best thing you can do is just let it lay. <coughs> Excuse me. It also uh, makes weed control a lot easier. If you've ever had to pick weeds out of a hardened soil, it's, it's backbreaking. Um, but picking them out of a heavy mulch area makes it a whole lot easier. I was very surprised that a lot of the wineries were not putting mulch around their um, uh, grapevines. And over the last eight or so years that we've been out here, there's more and more of them going now to where they're adding mulch 
to help with water conservation and also help with the weeds. The having a mulch on there helps with the permeability of the soil surface. If that soil gets hard, it's just like rain when it does come and, and you've got either concrete or formica top, the rain just keeps, it just goes right off. It's not absorbed into the soil. It's that water holding capacity of the soil which uh, your mulching helps. And this also increases the high organic matter, think permaculture, that is going to help with your trees. And this, this applies to uh, any fruit trees. Improvement in the uh, soil's physical properties. And this, uh, the, the most important part is that top 12 inches, remember that's where most of the avocado roots are active. It also reduces the temperature. I was amazed when um, I'm, I'm a, a teacher's assistant for some of the winemaking classes out here that are being taught at the local college. And the temperature differential in the summer between the soil that does not have mulch and the soil that does have mulch can easily be 10, 15 degrees or more. And this is going to be important when the temperatures are very high. When frosts are predicted, you want to remove some of that mulch if you can, because the bare soil will absorb more of the radiant energy of the sun than having to work through the mulch. Mulches do need to be checked though. Um, a lot of people, um, I recommend about four inches. Uh, two inches isn't enough, six inches is too much, but four inches is a good even number. And you want to check that at least once a year because as that mulch naturally breaks down, it's going to reduce not only its thickness, but its effectiveness in, in acting as a, a soil conditioner. Do not use freshly chipped wood or fresh manure. We're fortunate enough out here to have a neighbor that hauls our manure away um, uh, about three times a week. And uh, he has a huge compost bin or a compost area on his property. He's got about five acres out there. And he'll let that sit for about a year before he uses it. And he's been gathering that from us for about eight years. And uh, his garden does really nice every year. If you use freshly chipped woods, one of our first big projects out here was to take out about 100 pine and eucalyptus trees and pull the stumps. And I did not use any of that mul the mulched branches for a year. And um, if you use them too soon, as they decompose, they're going to leach nitrogen out of the soil. And that's exactly the opposite of what you want. You want that nitrogen to be in the soil. While we're on the subject of nitrogen, this brings us to fertilization and the values of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, avocado trees, um, other than MPK, they occasionally need some zinc. Um, iron, if it needs some of the um, iron, you're going to get this when the leaves go a little bit on the yellow side. Uh, you just have to watch it. A lot of times this avocado um, fertilizer is sold as avocado and citrus fertilizer. It's basically the same stuff for both of those. Um, and it's either 10, 10, 10 or like triple 15. And this is the components of that. As the trees get older, you might try to lower the nitrogen, which is the first number, especially if you're using um, some manures in that, it becomes less of an issue. Uh, some numbers, once again, if you're using chicken manure, by the way, if you don't know it, uh, we can now order chickens back in California as of the 1st of J June. The, at least up in this area, and I believe, I believe you guys as well, um, the Newcastle's disease ban is now over. So, um, but we use uh, our chicken manure. We do a deep clean typically on our chicken coops once a year, and then that sits in a pile for a year before we start incorporating it into um, the soil that we use in the garden. Um, once again, you apply during the flower and fruit set and carefully pay attention to the manual and the instructions. And this does vary by a variety to a certain degree. Some people will add a more dilute solution of fertilizer. They add it more often, but a more dilute solution. Uh, that might be a good idea because a lot of avocados or trees are very sensitive. You're better to underdo than to overdo with fertilizer. 
The recommendation is to water the soil before applying the fertilizer, apply it and then water it in. And you're not gonna wanna go out there with a, with a heavy rake and scrape that soil because remember you've got the surface roots and you can easily damage those. As a refresher to you, your nitrogen is essential for the plant growth and the green leaves. Your phosphorus stimulates the root development. Uh, it helps with the, the trunk and the stem growth and it also helps with the flower formation and therefore the fruit as well as the seed production. And your potassium aids in photosynthesis and helps reduce water loss and, and wiltings. And this is in addition to you know, some of the micronutrients that are involved in that. But once again, there's more um, papers in detail and we'll go into where you can get those in just a moment. Ah, which brings us to this, um, insects and pests. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I have found in the, the 15 years or so years that I've been doing a lot of these presentations and, and digging into the home fruit gardener, um, it's difficult to evaluate a lot of these, whether it's a, a bug uh, or whether it's a disease. I would certainly invest in a loop, what we photographers call a loop or a magnifying glass, like a jeweler's loop, um, at least an eight power, possibly more. Once you find what the culprit is, then you can identify it. And that goes a long way to correcting the problem. The best thing that I can recommend you do is we as taxpayers are helping pay for a very comprehensive collection of information on not only pests and diseases, but a variety of different topics on the home gardener. And this is through the Integrated Pest Management or affectionately referred to as IPM website. I have the link there for the avocado section. And I also have the homepage there. And believe me, and I know some of you uh, uh, have been to this before, there is more information on this website than you're ever going to be able to use on a variety of different things, including uh, flowering things. I know a lot of you are into the flowering stuff. Um, fortunately for me, um, I, I'm more into the fruit growing. And my wife, she's not impressed with flowers. Um, she's, she was very impressed this year because she has uh, a bunch of uh, what she refers to as blueberry trees um, sitting outside of the front window um, in 15, uh, number 15 pots and she's got about eight of those. So she's a happy camper right now. But um, a rose bush, no, she's not interested. So I'm happy there as well. As I mentioned before, the most common thing I see is the browning of the leaf tips and this is generally a salt burn. Uh, the commercial growers will actually remove some of these salts from their water, but that is typically beyond the scope of the home gardener. Um, capturing and using rainwater helps. If you, if you haven't done it yet, uh, now would be a good time to plan for the fall and get some, um, uh, some of the big barrels for capturing the, the rainwater from your gutters and whatnot. Um, the, some of the ones you're going to run into, there's uh, mites and thrips. There's a lace bug that's mostly down in, in y'all's area down there. So pay close attention to that. Um, I don't have to tell you what rats and mice are. There's a Mexican fruit fly that uh, likes avocado and any fruit bearing trees. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you, if you have a garden, you, you've got your fair share of snails and slugs. I haven't been able to teach my chickens how to get snails, um, but we don't have them very often out here because it's just too, too dry out here. Uh, some of the diseases, you're going to run into a couple different variations of root rot, which is a fungus. You also have some viruses, uh, the sun blotch. Uh, sunburn, uh, I shouldn't have to tell you about sunburn, but the bark, the branches, the fruit can get sunburned, and that's going to show up as a, as a dark brown spot. We have fruit and stem in rots. Do you remember that, uh, that queen avocado I told you? That's probably not going to ripen if they pulled it off of the tree and to look closely where that stem is joining and it's getting that little brown ring at the bottom of it, that's that stem end rot. And we see that a fair amount of time. You also have a, another fungus that uh, infects the bark um, and uh, or the trunk. And a lot of times you see this kind of white powder um, oozing from the bark. But once again, this is where 
once you've identified, hey, what is this? Does it look like a fungus? Does it look like a virus? Has it got yellow streaking on, on the young stems? Maybe it's sun blotch. Once you then, you go to the IPM website and they've got a step-by-step -step that will help you problem solve what that is. And it's just a great collection of stuff. Cold tolerance. Uh, this is one of those things you hear. Um, a matter of fact, I'm giving uh, the persimmon presentation to the San Francisco group here coming up um, next month. And uh, when they have a concern about uh, avocados up there and cold tolerance. Um, there are some varieties that the Mexican varieties specifically, these are the, uh, the thin skinned, smaller black ones. And by the way, the Mexican varieties have less of an avocado flavor. I, I have several friends that don't like that strong, buttery avocado flavor, and they like the Mexican uh, varieties. They don't like lengthy uh, extremes of heat or cold. They will drop the fruit um, if the temperature gets much above 100 degrees, especially after several days. The fruit will rot on the tree or drop prematurely with freezing temperatures. And if you are expecting uh, freezing temperatures, if drag out those old school Christmas tree lights that you haven't thrown away yet, and I'm not talking about LEDs, but they will put out a little bit of a heat that's just enough, especially if your tree is small enough that you can put um, a blanket or some sort of covering over it. And this is another reason not to have these huge trees. You've got a 20 foot tree, there's no way you're gonna be hanging Christmas tree lights enough in it to keep it uh, warm. But if you have one that's uh, eight or nine feet tall, you can probably very really easily reach that. Remember, heat rises, so if you put it in the lower branches, it's the heat's going to rise a little bit and those old school incandescent Christmas tree lights if you use it during the frost season which usually the last frost day is around March the 15th the Ides of March and uh, you can prevent that tree from freezing. Um, there are some of the varieties um, Mexicola, Surprise, Fuerte, uh, Bacon, Jim, Offshoot, Pinkerton, Zutano, Mexicola Grande, and uh, some people say um, your, your Haas, um, maybe. Um, uh, Gary Bender, who is one of the farm advisors, most of you are probably familiar with Gary. I think he's officially retired now, but I worked with him in the Cherimoya field before he retired. And he says that the Haas can stand temperatures as low as 29 degrees Fahrenheit for a few hours before it shows, in, shows any freeze damage. And remember, this is assuming that there's no uh, Christmas tree lights in there. So if uh, freezing temperatures are an issue for you, um, that might be of a concern. Unusual avocados, uh, daily 11 can get really big. Uh, matter of fact, if you see this photograph on the upper left, uh, it's got a Mexicola, a whole Mexicola avocado that is, you could probably put two or three of them in just the cavity created by the pit of the daily 11. Uh, we affectionately refer to it as, as daily II in the field. And you remember that brown plate where I had all those avocados on it? That plate is being filled by this one avocado. And that's, uh, I believe that's about a 12 inch plate uh, diameter on that plate. Um, and this is one like the queen, which is the one below there, that always impresses people. Frankly, I have found both the Daily 11 and the Queen, if they're picked at the right time, are, are actually pretty decent avocados. They're impressive because they're big, but if you pick them too early, they don't uh, ripen very well. And if you pick them too late, I have noticed both of them get a little what we call stringy. And you, you literally will see some strings on the inside of them. I wasn't thinking much about queens until one time I got one when it was just the right time and it was actually pretty nice. The, while we're on the subject of the queens, if we look on the, the bottom right hand side, what you're seeing there is those cukes that we talked about or those finger um, avocados. Those are seedless ones and uh, those are about the size of a small, a decent sized cucumber and uh, they're prized by chefs to use as a garnish. Um, upper right is a Don Galigli, 
and that was patented by Don in 1997. I've, I've seen a couple of these. Um, once again, there's that plate. You can get a sense of the size. And for whatever reason in that one, I had a six inch ruler there. So you can see that's about uh, probably seven inches. And it's got this very elongated neck. And that space, that, that kind of conical shaped space above it, it has this material that almost reminds me of gristle um, um, in meat that's above the seed. But it's a very distinctive uh, shaped avocado that you may bump into every now and then. Largest and heaviest, this is uh, new information that I, I gathered just for this presentation. They have the uh, Avozilla from Australia. It's a monster and they weigh about two, two and a half pounds and they sell for about $12 each. Now it's about four times the size of a regular avocado according to that chart there. So if a regular avocado is selling for uh, $3 or less, I guess that's a good deal. Um, and if it's a avocado that's selling for more than $3, that's a great deal. But I'm not sure I'm gonna pay $12 for an avocado regardless of the size. Uh, this originated in South Africa and it reached Britain, I guess, in 2013. I didn't know Britain was known for growing avocados. I would think it's too cold there, but I didn't dig too deep into this article but it appears most of the bigger ones grow down in Australia, which has a climate a lot of times similar to ours. The one on the right is now uh, got the Guinness World Record for the he world's heaviest avocado, and that weighs about uh, five and a half, a little bit over five and a half pounds, and that's about 15 times the weight of an average avocado. It's the size of this, this young man's head there, and that was grown in Hawaii. So that's some of the ones you might find. This is kind of an interesting chart. It talks about the average size. Remember we talked about the number of avocados that are needed to fill a 25 pound carton. And uh, the, this also helps you get a sense of based on an average amount of flesh. So if you've got a size, one of the larger ones there, a number 28, it's going to weigh about uh, we'll call it uh, 15 ounces, of which about eight and a half ounces of that is going to be the avocado flesh, and that's about a 70%. And those are some good average numbers. You'll notice as you go to the smaller ones, the pit size is increasing slightly in relationship to the flesh. And once again, this depends upon the variety. Um, but you're going to get a little bit less uh, percentage of the flesh from there. Uh, this was something that I thought was interesting. I just found these a few days ago, and this is avocado art. Uh, it's just absolutely spectacular. I can't believe somebody's got that much patience. The uh, top three are by the same individual in Thailand, and I have no idea how he's able to do that. Uh, one of the, the photographs show a kind of an elongated exacto knife, and maybe he's using um, uh, techniques that are similar to those that are working with clay. I don't know, but it looks just absolutely spectacular. And then you also have the bottom middle, the avocado pit art, and I didn't realize that was a thing. And you have somebody who's into designing the avocado food, a nice little appetizer there, and uh, a young woman that appears in Australia did the one on the far right, so I thought that was kind of cool. Here's some of the avocado crate labels that were used in the 40s and the 50s, and some of them you may have seen. Um, I Frankly, I never had an avocado growing up in the Midwest um, until I came out to California, and uh, so I don't recall seeing any of these. And by the time I was out here in the early 70s, most of these labels had, um, had hit the, the collections or the, um, those that, that saved these sort of things. Um, I found this fascinating. Um, turn of the century, the uh, USDA um, had a lot of artists go out and create original watercolors. 
And these are some of the varieties that were found at the time, including the one on the left, I believe is the Mexicola variety, which we still see today. And you can get a sense of how this large the seed is for that. And uh, I just think these are just absolutely gorgeous. I'm, I've got a fairly decent art collection myself, and I just love these sort of things. There's 108 different avocado images there. And I want to make sure that if you do use some of these in the future, there's an attribution statement that they want you to put on the bottom. But, uh, and they, by the way, they also did a bunch of other uh, fruits and, and nuts there. So go to that website. And it's, it's just a beautiful collection. Additional information and sources. This is where, uh, you know, a lot of the information that you're getting is not from my individual research. I'm basing a lot of my work done on by a lot of other people and also um, uh, give or take 12 or 13 years of hanging, hanging around with some bright people down there at South Coast Research Station. But here's links for where to go, including uh, South Coast Research. Once they get back up and running for the educational events, the fruit tasting, um, the IPM website, there's the hot links there or hyperlinks. Uh, CRFG, I don't have to tell you guys, but uh, CRFG does have the fruit facts, and there's the avocado one in addition to uh, other fruits. <coughs> you have, also have the Master Gardener website, um, avocado publications through the University of California, uh, David Karp, who's a, who's a bright guy dealing with avocados, Sunset, the watercolors that we talked about, uh, clonal rootstock, um, that's another way to get rootstock, but it's beyond the, the ability of most of us, certainly me. And then the avocado varieties, which is a, a primer, what I call a primer, that's compiled from the avocado uh, UCR website. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, it's been, once again, a, a, a nice thing. I'm sure there's going to be some questions. We're going to open that up in a moment, if we have time. John, I hope I'm not running over on this. <laughs> I'm also losing my voice, but that's okay. Here's some of the avocados we talked about. And wh whoever got this photograph, I love this thing. I can only hope that that was an actual avocado pit that was in that avocado, but that just makes a great thing. Uh, I don't know whether that was the intent. Um, if 2020 was an avocado in, in your, in your uh, invitation, but I kind of added the, the completion of that sentence. I didn't see it, but I thought that would be a natural uh, end to that because of the problems that we're having. And once again, I want to thank you all. So I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, sharing. Oh, one more thing before I stop sharing. This is the other thing that I will be uh, making available to John. This is the primer that we talked about. And it talks, once again, this is readily available on the website. I just took the liberty of putting it all together uh, in something that's a relatively cohesive form. And these are some of the varieties. It, it's got, I, by the way, I did not take the pictures. I'm not responsible for those, but it shows the varieties. It shows also um, the, uh, the leaves, the, both the flush and the mature. And it goes into whether it's a B flowering type or an A flowering type. And it's just got a lot of information in there. Talks about where they came from, talks about where they, uh, some growing tips with them. Uh, includes things like Kona Charwell, which is uh, um, the, all over the place. It ended up in Australia and over in Hawaii. Um, your Lamb Hosh, your Mexicola, and uh, some of the other things ending up with Reed. Uh, Topa Topa, and of course the last one is Zutana, which we don't see very more. Uh, that often out, even at the um, the farmers markets. So I'm going to go stop share right now, and I'll give it back over to John. <laughs>